Okay, well, good morning. Yeah, it's always a hard act to follow the deer guy. <laughs> Deer's such an interesting critter. Okay, uh, as Johnson mentioned, my name is Tom Matthews, and I worked for the Maryland DNR myself for 27 years and was involved as I sat there and reflected on Maryland's first whitetail deer management plan. It's amazing how quick time flies by. I'm now presently working, I am retired from the DNR, but I work as a contractor for an organization called the Wildlife Management Institute. And it's a nonprofit conservation group that's been around since the early 1900s. They do great work. And one of the things that I'm employed on now is an effort to make the public aware of how important young forest habitat is on the landscape and a whole group of wildlife species that need that habitat type. So this morning I'm actually going to present two PowerPoints. The first one is going to be on ecology and uh, habitat needs of rough grouse and woodcock. And then we're going to switch over <coughs> and do a broader PowerPoint on this whole effort of the Young Forest Initiative, which started out with woodcock and now has actually matured into a much broader uh, perspective. So we'll get started here. Uh, rough grouse. How many people have actually seen a rough grouse in Maryland? Okay, so in Maryland? Okay. The reason I ask that question is rough grouse are sort of limited in Maryland. Okay, they're a bird of the western Allegheny and Garrett County and a little bit into Frederick County. So in Maryland, they have, they're not really a widespread species. A lot of, species, a lot of forest landowners would have had the opportunity to see. Uh, it's called the rough grouse because the male around its neck has a, a, a bunch of dark feathers that we call the rough. Okay, it's a smallish bird about a pound or, or a little bit more, uh, very inconspicuous. It uh, looks just like the leaf, the forest floor in an oak forest, so it's very difficult to see. The males have the dark rough, as I talked about. And absent the springtime, whenever the, the hen has her chicks, they're pretty solitary. You don't usually see a lot of rough grouse together like you do some wildlife species. Uh, this is, well, in the spring, okay, whenever the hen has her young, and for the next couple of months, all right, you may see three or four or five uh, a smallish flock of grouse, but most of the time, the rest of the year, after they disperse in the fall and go out on their own, you don't usually see, but, you know, you, bird hunters might flush one and then one a couple minutes later, but they're a pretty solitary bird, okay? They're not like a herd of deer. Okay, this is the male that's got the, the rough, which is this little feather patch here, okay? Uh, when we look at a bird in the forest, it's almost, unless you see a male uh, strutting or on a drum log doing their courtship display, pretty, pretty difficult to tell males from females. But in the hand, all right, we have hunting season, it's a, it is a game bird, and in the hand we can actually tell whether we've got a male or female by the length of the central tail feathers on the end. All right, you can see here that the central tail feather for a female was typically less than 157 millimeters, the length of a dollar bill, and males are going to be longer. We also have rump spots uh, on the male that can be another distinguisher. Uh, the, the grouse come in different color phases. Around here we have the typical brown color phase, but up north we're on the sort of the southern tip of rough grouse range. They do go a little, do go a little further south into the Appalachians. But around here, that's the bird that we typically see. But they do they do occur in a red color or in a uh, gray color phase, uh, a little bit further north, and occasionally around. Here. This is a nice photograph here of the the male on a on a log. In the springtime, have you ever heard the uh, male bird drumming? Have I heard that? Okay. Uh, if you don't laugh at me, I'm going to try to imitate a little bit what that sounds like. Some people would say says it sounds like an out-of-tune single-cylinder Ford tractor, okay? But this time of the year here in the spring, the males like to climb up on a log where they can sit in the forest floor, and then early in the morning, okay, and what they're doing, this is a picture right here of a, of a drumming bird, okay? They're not actually hitting their chest with their feathers. 
but they do it so fast that it compresses the air and makes that drumming sound, okay? And this is what's going on right here in this photograph right here. These are what we call the primary feathers. And very quickly, uh, a lot of people, a lot of photographers spend a lot of time. I have a friend that spend every spring just to try to capture the photograph of a drumming grouse. It's pretty special uh, for a photographer to be able to do that. Okay, this shows us the range, if you will, then of rough grouse. And it's very uh, similar to the range of aspen. Okay, and again, in our neck of the woods here in Maryland, we do have aspen. We have aspen in Garrett County, but it's not near as widespread and as common as we have it further north. <clears throat> aspen is a primary food for grouse. Okay, grouse is one bird that's not really hindered by deep snowfall, and I'll get to that in a little minute. They actually roost under the snow, but they can go fly up into the aspen trees in harsh winter weather and they'll actually eat the buds of the male aspen. So very, very uh, definite correlation between the range of grouse and the presence of aspen. Okay, right here in Maryland then, you can see us right here. You can see the range of grouse coming right down through western Maryland. Twenty-some uh, years ago, there was a, an effort in Maryland to actually wild trap birds from western Maryland and move them to Charles County. The habitat, habitat, habitat down there looked re, re, you know, respectable, but it just never worked out. So they, they never really went any further east naturally than uh, Frederick County. Okay, grouse habitat. Uh, both grouse and woodcock like dense vertical stems. Okay, you can see how nice and thick the understory of this woodlot, what this woodlot looks like. Grouse habitat equals early successional forest with high stem density. Thousands of stems per acre is really what the rough grouse prefers, okay? Males drum to attract the females. We talked about the drumming logs. And this is a picture here of a grouse, a clutch of eggs, usually around 8 to 12 eggs that are going to be laid just about this time of the year. This is a habitat. Some typical nest you can see uh, under the overhang of a, a rock at the base of a dead snag. And this is a close-up of the hen actually incubating the eggs. Uh, excuse me? Well, they do have predation, absolutely. Snakes, raccoons, skunks, you know, black rat snakes, etc. cetera. Uh, Brian probably mentioned, did you speak about turkey this morning? Yes. Feral cats are a problem. Feral cats and house cats, even not even feral cats, are a tremendous problem on wildlife in general. Okay, cats love to kill stuff. Okay, I mean we all know that, and there's been that, there's been a lot of studies. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the organization did that. I think it was Audubon and some of those significant issues with cats and wildlife. Rough grouse, I would say, cats on rough grouse are not any kind of a significant issue. Uh, you know, the, the, the habitat where you find grouse is not, there could be some cats around, but typically not a significant issue for, for rough grouse. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, the egg laying of grouse. It's sort of similar to the biology of the wild turkey, okay? Uh, they lay one egg a day, all right, for about 10 days to 12 days, and then only after that entire clutch is laid, do they actually start to incubate? So it's pretty amazing then, and what the result of that is that all the birds hatch about the same time. Okay, so it's, it's pretty interesting. A hen lays eight to 13 days, incubate about 24 days, and they all hatch at the same time. Okay, brood habitat. Brood habitat, that's a term we use for the type of habitat that the young poults need. So two words, poults, it's a term for young turkeys, young pheasants, young grouse just out of the nest, okay, downy little puffballs. But after a couple of days, they're very mobile. They can move around. Uh, habitat is grassy areas with lots of insects, okay. Both turkeys and rough grouse in that first four to eight weeks need a lot of insects because insects are very high in protein, and these guys are growing very quickly. So a lot of insects are necessary. They don't live or find as many insects in an open forest understory with just open trees as much as they will along a woods road 
where you've got some grasses coming up in a little field along the edge of a farm hay field or something like that. So we need insects. Great grouse habitat here in uh, early spring to late summer. This is what these uh, insects we're talking about here. Grasshoppers would be one good place, good protein. Now this all changes in the fall, okay? <clears throat> in the fall, well first off, only a small percentage of the chicks, you know, of those eight to 12 eggs that were laid in the spring, only a small percentage of them are gonna live to September. And a big problem with that is aerial predators, okay? Uh, they will disperse up to 20 miles from where they were initially, where that initial nest was. As they grow, they'll disperse out and the adults will shift to winter habitat near food sources. In our neck of the woods, because we don't have that much aspen, uh, hard mast is a very important fall food. Uh, also soft mast, this is a fox grape here, which are very good fall foods also. And again, we got the dense understory for protection. Oh, they, they eat them. Yep, wow. yep, yep. Okay, uh, winter time. Winter time is tough on a lot of critters, but the grouse gets along probably better than a lot of them do. All right, and uh, I'll get ahead of myself a minute though. Aerial predators are a problem with grouse because uh, there was a study, I'll get to that in a minute too. There was a study done that showed the primary mortality factor on grouse is aerial prediction. Okay. One, one of the ways that they both get through the winter elements and protect themselves from predation is what we call snow roosting. These birds will actually, get in deep snows, you get 20 inches of snow in the northern forest, they'll actually go under the snow, okay? And if you think about it, it's like a little igloo. It's a thermal protection mechanism for them, and it also protects them from being visible to aerial predators. So it's an adaptation that's worked out very well for rough grouse. Okay, so a little bit about habitat management as woodland owners, and I applaud your initiative to come to this great workshop Jonathan does every year. Uh, for grouse, it's important to revert succession back to a young forest class. The most efficient way to do that is through timber harvesting. So if you've got a property, if you're from Western Maryland, you're interested in doing work for improving for grouse habitat, uh, get involved with your county forester, get some resource professionals to give you some assistance. Uh, the, the hardest question that when I used to do habitat improvement for private landowners was they would generally be interested in increasing wildlife habitat quality on their farm. But, you know, the difference for one species, what you can benefit for can be opposite to the benefit to another species. If, if, just to make it real simple, uh, cottontail rabbit is a, is a critter that likes brushy, rush, brushy piles, you know, rough, uh, brushy habitat. Gray squirrel likes big, large oak, oak trees and, and uh, cavities, all right? So two diametrically different types. But you can look at your landscape with a resource professional. You can look at what the potential habitat capability is for your landscape and what your interests are and, and meld together a plan that's going to make that work. If we're talking about gra or for grouse management, two main types of timber management are going to be clear cuts, okay, or seed tree or shelter wood where, again, we're, we're harvesting the majority of the overstory. Both of these types benefit grouse. Uh, we, we, but first off, we have to look at what the current forest conditions are for your woodlot, and uh, that may or may not be the recommendation for that moment in time. Uh, clear cuts are a uh, standard practice on public lands in Western Maryland. Uh, they don't really use that term anymore, but uh, the, the, it, it's uh, basically where we're removing most of the overstory, and uh, certain silvicultural practices require that. Uh, sometimes not. <clears throat> After a couple years of a clear cut, uh, we'll begin to get regeneration back. It starts to provide some grouse habitat, but really the best habitat comes about 8 to 15 years after you have harvested the, the timber. So uh, an another message about habitat management is it's a slow process, okay? We don't get immediate results, okay? We put together a resource plan for a long term and stay the course, after a while you start to see the habitat improve and, 
and you'll see the wildlife respond to improved habitat conditions. This is just a little diagram to show you a little bit how uh, when we're looking at improving grouse habitat, well, first off, we have to look at, I think uh, Brian probably mentioned that the home range of a white-tailed deer is about a square mile. The home range of a grouse is only about 40 acres, so it's much different. I mean, the critter that we're trying to improve for, we have to look at what its home range is and what its habitat needs are, okay? For rough grouse, we're going to be uh, having a mosaic on, on every 40 acres. They have some conifers for winter cover, uh, have some uh, 10 to 15 year old uh, forest for the primary type that they need. But then as that, as that forest type begins to mature and move into pole size timber, then maybe somewhere else on that property we want to cut another 10 or 15 acres. So at any point in time, you know, we always have the habitat type that the grouse needs. This is excellent grouse habitat. <coughs> High stem densities, good brushy understory. We have a logging road. It's always a good practice uh, when you do timber harvesting on your property. Uh, after the timber sale to have the logging road seeded down and stabilized both for soil control and also to create bugging areas for birds like rough grouse. And we have mass trees also for that winter food that we were talking about. Okay, back in the late 90s, uh, there was a five or six state collaborative effort to study uh, the biology and limiting factors and dynamics, if you will, of rough grouse. It was Kentucky and West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Maryland, a bunch of states. Very, uh, very intensive effort uh, where uh, grouse, which are difficult to catch in the wild, were actually captured and then there were radios attached to those. Radio telemetry in the last 30 years has been an amazing tool to help biologists study the secretive habits of many wildlife species. Okay, what did we find through that study? Okay, the grouse rely on hard mast extensively and access to hard mast have high reproduction rates. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense because if any wildlife species that has plenty of food, it's just like gray squirrels. If we have two or three years in a row when we have a good acorn crop, the gray squirrels go into the, into the winter very healthy with good body fat reserves and their reproduction rate goes up. If we have a very poor failure in mast crop, just the opposite occurs. Well, the same thing with grouse. We have a good food source. We found that we had higher reproductive rates. Chick survival appeared to be a limiting factor, but it was better in good years of good mass production. All right, honey that took as many as 35% of grouse had no impact on the breeding population. And this is true when we set hunting seasons for many types of wildlife, or what we call game species. Hunting, hunting biologists typically set hunting harvest rates that don't affect overall the population of wildlife. In other words, what I'm saying here is hunters can take up to 35% of the grouse population and not affect it, okay? We're hunting these birds in the fall of the year before winter. Whether we hunt them or not, there's gonna be a certain amount of them are gonna be killed by predators anyhow. So this is, this is the percentage that they found and that helps biologists set bag limits and season lengths uh, in different parts of the country. And avian predators, sharp shin hawks, all right, Cooper's hawks, goss hawks, uh, can be a pretty significant, although natural, dynamic that's occurring out there on the landscape. So project emphasizes the need to provide food and cover, early successional habitats the key in close proximity. Other management recommendations are to encourage fruit bearing trees and shrubs, uh, up in Garrett, Allegheny County, there's a natural tree called hawthorn. Uh, it's, a, a, it's sometimes called white thorn. It's a crab apple type plant, very valuable for uh, rough grouse. And when we're doing um, clear, cutting, clear cutting and management harvest for grouse, small areas are better. Two to five acres, maybe this year, wait five years, go somewhere else on your prop, do another two to five acres, okay? And uh, prescribed burning or herbicides can control unwanted tree species. 
and something that a dynamic that's really in the last 15 years has really become problematic for a lot of forest management is invasive species. Uh, we have just such a problem anymore, so it's a little more complicated than it used to be. When you do a prescribed uh, clear cut or something else, you have to look at what's there and make sure that we're not going to have a problem. And I think Brian showed the same photo because it's so, it's so dramatic a picture that, and it's really the truth. You know, if you can't manage the white-tailed deer, you're going to have an uphill man battle managed for other species that love forest understory. Because these, a deer in this kind of high population number is going to have a very negative effect on grouse habitat. Okay, we're going to switch gears now to another forest game animal. And actually, its range in Maryland is much more uh, widespread than rough grouse, and that is the American woodcock. <coughs> okay, raise a hands. Who has actually seen a woodcock in Maryland? Okay, so only two or three people in the room have, only, have ever seen one. Wouldn't surprise me because they're very uh, camouflaged, okay, and they're active just at dusk and just get dawn, times when a lot of us are sleeping or not out there in the forest, okay? They're a migratory species, and they're really not seen too common by general forest landowners, okay? Uh, it is a migratory species. It's regulated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, all right? We do have hunting seasons for American woodcock, but they're very limited. Uh, it breeds primarily north of us up to Canada and the Great Lakes, uh, we do have some breeding and reproduction in Maryland, but limited. Uh, it winters in the southeast U.S. and does winter in Maryland along the uh, Chesapeake Bay and the eastern shore. Uh, peak migration through the state is in late October on into December. In, in Garrett and Allegheny County, the peak migration is about the first week of November. Okay. <coughs> Woodcock is uh, a species that has really had some problems for a long time. This is a graph here put out by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, in the last 40 years, you can see that the population has been declining about 2% a year. And this is primarily a habitat-driven issue, okay? The reason that it is is that the woodcock is primarily a bird that needs this young forest habitat, and I'm going to... Just give me a soft couple of minutes to the next couple of photographs and we'll get, get into that a little bit better. But the courtship behavior of this guy is in the spring. Right now, in the last four weeks, is when woodcock have been, dis the male woodcock has been displaying and breeding activity is occurring. All right, they sing just at dusk, and I'm going to try to imitate the sound of the woodcock. Okay, I can actually do this better than the grouse. Okay. Okay, the woodcock is a very unique sound, and once you heard it in the wild, you'd have it, okay? It goes, me, me, me. All right, it's called a peent, done by the male woodcock, okay, just at dusk, okay? They have a courtship display, it's called the sky dance. This bird has as much interest from people that are hunters and have bird dogs, people that are just birders because it's such an unusual bird and it's so entertaining to watch, okay? Just at dusk in an open area in the forest, close to thick cover, okay? The male will come out on those little open areas, eight acre areas, we call them singing grounds, okay? And the male bird, okay, on the ground, okay? If I'm a woodcock, it'll go meep, and it'll move his couple feet, meep, meep, and then it goes, up in the air about 100, 150 feet. Now when it gets up there 150 feet, it starts to fly, and now it tweeters. And faster and faster and faster and faster in a figure eight pattern, and then when it gets tired of that, right back to where it went up. You've got to see this. Okay. If you have on your woodlot wetlands, moist areas, okay, this bird feeds 90% on earthworms. Okay, it probes into the soil with that long two and a half inch plus beak. And so it has to be an area where there's wetlands, an open display area, a courtship area, 
in thick, what we call diurnal habitat of four to 5,000 stems per acre. And I'm going to show you some photographs in a minute, give you some sense of what I'm talking about. The most interesting thing about this guy is he feeds on earthworms. So how does he take that two and a half inch probe, go down into the soil, think about a pair of needle nose pliers, okay? If you went down to the ground and tried to open them up, what happens? They're too deep. Okay, nature's adaptation. Just the last quarter inch of that wood top has a hinge on it. A little hinge. Goes down in there, opens up that little hinge, grabs that earthworm, and up it comes. Just, just amazing. Okay. Huh? You'll have to ask the woodcock. Just like the robin, I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right. question, the torchicary, he said about an eighth of an acre, but I don't know what that is. How many feet across, or yards across, did he say? An eighth of an acre? Uh, an eighth of an acre would be from, the, from here to that wall square, this okay. real big room, okay. roughly, okay, just roughly. It's not, a, not that big of an area, okay. It's not critical. They will sing in logging roads. They will sing on pa at the edge of pasture fields. Uh, the critical element is more of the proximity to good diurnal habitat. Yes, sir. I'm from Charles County, and I noticed you mentioned the ranging pattern of the uh, the range of the earlier bird, which is the rough grouse. Rough grouse, right? You said you brought them to Charles <coughs> County; they didn't survive. God bless you. But if the range was forty, it, uh, which is forty well, acres, forty acres, forty right. acres, what happened to all of those that you brought to Charles County? They just die? Yeah. Yeah, predation probably. They, the bottom line is they did not reproduce. Okay. The adults, if they weren't pre have predation, eventually died, but there was no reproduction. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay, so this guy has a little smaller clutch size than the grouse. He's only laying two to four eggs, so the reproductive rate is smaller. All right. Incubates a few days less, and again, the chicks leave the nest immediately. Okay, we talked about how the primary diet's earthworms and the specialized flexible bill, the moist soils, and the preference for edges. Uh, important roosting sites, abandoned farmlands. Uh, in New England back 30 years ago, tremendous grouse and woodcock habitat was present because a lot of those old farmsteads, the small farms, if you will, they were all sort of abandoned as our culture changed, and they reverted to this young forest habitat, this phenomenal grouse and woodcock habitat. Now in the last 20 years, that same habitat is starting to grow up and come into a pole-sized forest, okay? So the, it's a dynamic that's constantly changing, and this, this need to manage for these guys is difficult because the forest is constantly growing out of that age class that they like into a, into a much more mature forest. Okay, great habitat for woodcock here. Okay, this is a small pudgy bird that does not fly quick. Okay, it's a small bird. It's got a lot of charm to it, but one of the problems is it's, it doesn't have good flying skills. A, a rough grouse, who, who's ever jumped a grouse in the forest? Anybody? I can tell you they scare you to death and they fly very fast, not the, okay, not the woodcock. The woodcock goes up out of the, when you, uh, the main reason why uh, hunters, the really purists that like to hunt woodcock is because the bird stinks for a dog, smells, got, you know, for a dog, with, I'm not a dog, but dogs really lock in on them, okay? They have good odor, and the whole game about hunting woodcock is you're bonding with the dog. You raise this dog, you train this dog, you understand every mannerism. We have a woodcock hunter that just walked in. He's going to be your next presenter, and he can tell you about this. Okay, he's smiling already. Okay, all right, but it's all about you and the dog. So when you're out there with your dog and he points, point is whenever we see the dog lock up because he smells the presence of a woodcock. Okay, then you, the hunter, get in position. But when they fly out, they don't fly like a grouse. They just sort of, you know, so they're, they're a lot easier game target, but. The thing about the, the woodcock hunt is the dog not so much taking the bird. Okay, so feeding areas, uh, roost sites are much larger areas. This is where the bird, after feeds and, and does its courtship, this is where they spend the night. They don't spend the night in the forest. 
They spend the night in, out in wide roosting areas because, again, they don't have uh, good escape. They need to look at predators coming at them so they don't want to be in thick cover. Uh, this is a typical singing ground. We talked about these, these little open areas uh, with some white thorn and crab apple around. Uh, similar to grouse habitat with high stem density, again, timber harvest is, is important where we're cutting one to five acres on a rotation. <clears throat> and, and, and like the grouse, this is, uh, the grouse is, this, the, the column here, this guy is different than the grouse. The grouse, remember I talked about the 40 acre home range. This is a migratory species. Okay, a lot of birds are going to be coming through Maryland here in, in April and sort of singing their way north, okay? In the summer months, we don't have woodcock here, and it picks up in October and November. But, uh, so the, the primary, uh, if you're looking at the landscape, we'd like to have 500 acres, optimally. I don't want to discourage small woodlet owners from managing. I know you guys, particularly in Maryland, 20, 30 acres is it you can still do improvements for woodcock there. And like a lot of wildlife species, get together with your neighbors, okay, and collaboratively form a network of interest in wildlife, get resource professionals involved with you, and collectively you can do some good stuff. So don't be discouraged just because you own a, a little bit of land. Okay, this is a perspective here of some good woodcock habitat. Uh, this area here is the diurnal habitat we're talking about. This is where they're going to be feeding and getting the earthworms. These are the roosting sites in the singing ground areas. Notice that all this stuff is in close proximity. Okay, and that's important. All right, <coughs> grouse and woodcock are declining uh, because of the change in the landscape and the less prevalence of young forest habitat. So this is all about me talking to you today, letting you recognize that fact. And if you on your property might have the opportunity or the potential to make some improvements, then you may want to consider. Okay. With the word diurnal, what means for it? What kind of uh, diurnal, it means daytime. Daytime, I'm sorry. Uh, versus nocturnal is another. Okay, all right. Okay. Okay, if. Maybe in the last couple of days you've heard the term soft edge, okay, so you guys know what that's about. Uh, grouse and woodcock are species that benefit from soft edge, okay. Uh, this is a, a, a agricultural field with a hard edge, no, in other words, no transition from the agricultural element to the woods element. This is a much better approach for a lot of wildlife species where we have this type of a habitat between agricultural field and the woodlot, okay. There's a lot of other wildlife <coughs> that benefit from this habitat type that we're talking about for grouse and woodcock, and I won't read them to you, but you can see here one of the species right here at the top, the golden wing warbler, is a species that's actually, uh, there's been a lot, of, a, a lot of national effort to improve habitat condition for it. Now in Maryland, that's another species in the west of the state. Uh, that typically has to be in habitat above 900 feet, but the Natural Resources Conservation Service, uh, if you live in that part of the world and you have wood loss, they're actually providing cost-sharing money uh, to improve habitat conditions for golden-winged warbler. 